Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to The 51%, a show about women reshaping our world. Coming up, in what is set to be a landmark deal for gender equality, the EU is set to vote on legislation where companies will face mandatory quotas to ensure women have at least 40% of seats on corporate boards. Also, as the Taliban continues to ban schooling for girls aged over 11, we meet the Afghan people risking all to ensure girls receive an education. And the story of Viola Smith, the first female professional jazz drummer who fought for greater recognition of women in the industry. But first, and European Union negotiators have agreed to the bloc's first ever quota for women on corporate boards. In an historic decision, the EU legislation will oblige companies in all 27 EU member states to have women take up at least 40% of non-executive board seats by the middle of 2026. Companies could also be fined for failing to recruit enough women and see board appointments being cancelled if they don't comply with the new law. The legislation will be voted on later this year. Joining me now from Vilnius is Carleen Scheel, who's the Director of the European Institute for Gender Equality. Carleen, thank you so much for your time. Firstly, why the need for such an agreement? Well, it's, it's very important that uh, company boards reflect the societies they are operating in. And um, so with this directive, um, company boards will uh, be more diverse, bring in talents from both women and men, be more creative and lead to higher productivity. It's taken 10 years for EU negotiators to reach a common position in drafting this legislation. Why did it take such a long time? Well, it is true that when the proposal was launched um, almost 10 years ago, it was mainly big member states who were reluctant, uh, but they have apparently changed their mind. And what I also think really makes a difference is that um, Ursula von der Leyen, the first women president of the Commission, has been very vocal on gender equality, but specifically also on the, on the relevance to have women in leadership positions. As she said, it, it makes a business case. The business case of having women in leadership positions is clear. And we also have um, Commissioner Dali, the first commissioner in equality, also keeps stressing how important it is to have women in leadership positions. And then, of course, the French presidency uh, worked very hard to have, uh, let's say, all the member states agree on this directive. So that's all, I mean, that's all elements that's contributed to this success. Are there other parts of the world where quotas in this sector have been in place for a while? And if so, what impact have they had? Well, if, if we look at the European Union, um, and that's that's basically what uh, my institute is, is focusing on, we have been collecting data on uh, women and men in leadership positions in the EU, and we see a clear distinction between those member states who have hard legislation, quota, and those who haven't. So the ones with quota, they have made progress, and the, in the others, in the other member states, it has been pretty, pretty slow. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that this groundbreaking uh, directive will make a difference in the European Union. Carleen, this is a question that both you and I can answer very quickly. But in the end, what difference will this legislation make? What does it mean for people in the EU? For people in the EU, this, this legislation means that um, women will no longer be overlooked that in selection panels, there will be also attention for women and that the talents of both women and men will be used in company boards. Company boards will be more diverse, more creative, and in the end, I'm sure it will lead to more productivity of companies all over the European Union. Carleen Shield, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. And turning now to Afghanistan, and since the Taliban regained power last August, girls over the age of 11 have been banned from going to middle and high school, this despite their initial promise to lift restrictions. Our team headed to the western city of Herat to meet those determined to allow girls of all ages 
to continue with their education. Ten months ago, this high school student was immersed in her school books. She now spends her days stitching clothes on this sewing machine. Since Taliban took power, girls over the age of 11 are prohibited from school. Since the day they closed the schools, I turned to sewing. It keeps me busy and allows me to relieve the stress I feel. It's so difficult. Every night I imagine that when I wake up in the morning, I will go to school. But that never happens. Everything is depressing. For their own safety, these two high school sisters want to remain anonymous. Like millions of Afghan women, they are disappointed. Although the Taliban had initially promised to let them study, they still have to fulfill that promise. Taliban want this, that women are just for working at home and boarding child. But we shouldn't brook our dreams and our hopes. I want to continue my education. One day I will be a good doctor here and a service to my people and community. In this private school in the center of the city, boys and girls are studying side by side, but only until the sixth grade. Older girls are excluded. Who can tell me what these scientists invented? Yes, Khadija, come. My sweet child, can you tell me? It's Thomas Edison. He invented electricity. Bravo, yes, he invented electricity. Nadia Vilami tries to look unruffled in front of her students. But when she thinks of her former students who are banished from school, she struggles to hold back her tears. I hope God will open the doors for us. I wish that one day, with God's help, schools will reopen for older girls. It is my wish and my request to the Islamic Emirate to think about the older girls. In the heart of the city under hiding, some Afghan women have decided to fight the injustice. This teacher gives lessons to about 50 middle and high school girls in the backyard of her house. They were my students in public uh, school. For example, she is and they are. And others are not in public school. I'm scared, but I agree to risk my life by giving these lessons in hiding. Because when a man studies, it's for himself. But when a woman studies, society benefits as a whole because it's the women who raise the children who will make up the society of tomorrow. In an other district of the city, some fathers are mobilizing to convince the Taliban to let their daughters study. They take their appeal to the mullah of the local mosque. We want you to go to the governor and ask him to talk to the authorities about reopening the schools for girls. Okay, I assure you that I will ask the government to open classes to girls while respecting Islamic Sharia. As a specialist in Islam, I think that if education is a need for men, it is also a need for women. But within an Islamic framework, men and women should not be together in the classroom. Only women should teach female students. I'm in favor of opening schools for girls, but only within the framework of these Islamic rules. Some senior Taliban officials share this opinion, but the hardliners do not. And to this day, they are the ones in control. Now, in the history of jazz, it's rare to find female musicians mentioned as equals alongside their male counterparts. There were plenty of big-name singers, of course, but as for musicians, well, that's another story. James Mulholland has this report on America's Viola Smith, nicknamed the fastest girl drummer in the world, who during the 1940s fought for the recognition of women in the industry. In the golden age of jazz, female musicians were hard to find in the orchestras of Benny Goodman, Duke Ellington or Glenn Miller. Jazz women were mostly singers like Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughan or Billie Holiday. Those who took up instruments were relegated to sideshow status, like the Schmitz sisters, later called the Smith sisters. Viola Smith was the drummer, one of the first women to play professionally. 
1938, she formed the Coquette. Still, she struggled to earn real respect as a musician. But her skill was on a par with the likes of Chick Webb, and her showmanship rivaled that of Jean Krupa. Smith was featured on the front cover of Billboard magazine in 1940, and when America's men went off to war in 1942, she took up the pen to give band leaders a serving. Instead of replacing them with what may be mediocre talent, why not let some of the great girl musicians of the country take their places? Think it over, boys. Today, the gender gap has narrowed. Take France's Julie Sori, seen here in her early years as a professional. Now, when she plays alongside women like Anne Paseo, there's a real regard for the jazz and not the gender. And the two virtuosos know how much they owe to Viola Smith. It makes you wonder, why did I never learn about her earlier? When you know there were several female musicians who were erased from history, it's really surprising. We have to celebrate Viola. It's thanks to her with these all-female big bands that it all started. She's the heart and soul, the origin of it all. Viola Smith couldn't break through the glass ceiling in the jazz age, but she never put away her drumsticks right up until her passing in 2020 at a dynamic 107 years of age. And that's all for now. You can keep up with the 51% on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter. Plus, you can catch our previous programs on the France 24 website. So until our next show, bye for now.